Chat with Traders, episode 84. The biggest secret of the best traders in the world is that they're just like everyone else. However, they've worked hard to learn the markets and discover what works and what doesn't. But how can you hear about these journeys and get in on the strategies and tactics they use? You can do it by listening to Chat with Traders. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. What is going on, fam? I'm grateful to have you here. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Welcome to another episode. Before we get into this episode, I have a small favor to ask from you. Okay, so here it goes. I would love it if you could please take just a few minutes to complete a very brief, totally anonymous survey. Now, I'll tell you why I'm running this survey. As you know, the podcast is free to listen to anytime on demand. The way the podcast is supported financially is thanks to sponsors. And as you could imagine, sponsors want to have a pretty good idea on who their message is going out to. And of course, I just want to get to know you a little better as well. So if you can spare just a couple minutes, please go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash survey and complete, I think it's about 15 questions. They're all multi-choice answers. It's very easy. And like I said, it'll take you no more in a couple of minutes. So that's at chatwithtraders.com forward slash survey. And just because I really do appreciate you taking the time to do this and ultimately show your support, I'm going to give you a free gift. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is right now, but if you go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash survey, uh, everything is there. So if you can support the podcast by completing the survey, please do that. I'd be hugely grateful. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about this week's episode. Uh, It was actually recorded back in March. I'm not sure why it's taken me so long to release this one, but anyway, here it is, and it's with Dr. Eve Hilpish, the founder of the Python Quants. The Python Quants do a lot of good for those involved in quantitative finance. As such, they frequently host meetups and workshops have developed platforms and analytics libraries, and often contract to exchanges, banks, and hedge funds for custom Python development. Eve is also a three-time published author, with his most notable title probably being Python for Finance, which was released through O'Reilly. He regularly gives presentations and speaks at events on the subject of quant finance and lectures at universities too. Needless to say, he is a busy man, but I was thrilled to lock him down for the podcast. So over the next 60 minutes, you'll hear us unpack many subjects related to being a quant and why programming in Python can be a useful skill to have in your toolbox. Now, I will mention some of the discussion in the later part may be a little heavy for non-programmers. So if there is something that doesn't make sense or you'd like more context around, please just write in the comments at chatwithtraders.com forward slash 84 and I'll either do my best to answer this for you or point you in the right direction with a link or I may even ask Eve if he can respond himself. Anyway, I hope you can take something away from this. I'm Aaron Firefield. Here is Eve Hillpitch. Hey Eve, welcome to the Chat With Traders podcast. Thank you so much for being here. How's it going? Good. Well, very well. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. No trouble whatsoever. Now, I know you're not exactly a trader, but you are heavily involved in quantitative finance, and you're also a huge advocate for the Python programming language. So, I mean, guys listening know that I've been you know, learning Python myself over the last kind of six to eight months give or take. So maybe the reason your hair is slightly selfish, but <laughs> nevertheless, I think you'll be able to share some awesome insight for listeners, especially from a quant perspective as well. So I'd like to start by talking about how you originally got into finance. So take us back. Where did the interest come from? What well, is kind of interesting. When I was uh, pretty young, I wanted to become a medical doctor, uh, actually. So <laughs> But my uh, girlfriend back then and wife right now, actually, she was interested in, in business administration. So I, I started to get interested as well, uh, reading stuff she brought back home, so to say, about business and finance, things like that. This was actually the first time I was like 17 or something uh, when I 
actually heard for the first time about that topic that you can study that and so forth. For me, my family was all about medical uh, discipline, more or less. Um, and later on, actually, when I started out, really it wasn't finance as we understand it as of today, but uh, I started selling insurance policies back then, which had kind of uh, an investment component. So I started like uh, following. Uh, financial markets, I was really intrigued by asset management, by mutual funds and savings products and so forth. And this was actually the first point. So uh, this led me to later on during my studies uh, to focus on financial market theory, banking. and uh, Actually, every, everything I did during my, my diploma uh, with uh, a major of business uh, was about finance, financial markets and so forth. So started out quite early and it led me to yeah, focusing on this, uh, on this area actually. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so just so we're clear, you graduated with a diploma in, what was it, finance? Business, business, business. administration, but I had a strong focus on, on economics, financial economics, as it was called. Um, I later on moved on and did my PhD in uh, mathematical finance. So uh, I then specialized even more, obviously, started doing uh, option pricing theory, dynamic hatching strategies and stuff like that. So it was kind of a, a continuum of what I did. So Right. Okay. So when you did your PhD, what were your intentions um, of studying for that? Like, how did you plan on using this after you graduated? Actually, I hadn't any concrete plans for or to use the stuff that I did during my studies. It was really that I really enjoyed doing uh, this uh, PhD work and I uh, fiercely wanted to do it. So there was no question of not doing it. I simply did it. Um, and during this time, I did it kind of in external mode, uh, which is something you can do in Germany, actually, uh, where you do part-time at the university and then you can do other work or whatsoever. I started working during that time. It's roughly a total of a cross total of four years. I started working as a management consultant uh, for financial companies. Uh, so it wasn't really in this hardcore computational quantitative finance area, uh, but still it was in the financial industry. Um, and only later on I, I merged the two areas, if you like, my professional background of consulting, management consulting work and quant finance and obviously these days technology <laughs> to, to what we do uh, today. But this took quite a while couple of years. Okay, sure. So tell us about that first job you had. Like what was your role when you did finally, you know, merge those two together and you were starting to put your quantitative knowledge to use? It was actually for the the first three of my first three years of my professional working life, if you like. Uh, where, as I said, in the management consulting area, and I did this for, for quite a while afterwards when we founded our own company, the first one in 2001 already. Uh, I got on my own with uh, two partners, and we, we still did the same things, but I already started back then uh, bringing more and more quantitative things into what we did, uh, and now it's kind of, uh, yeah, it was a gradual uh, transition, but now I'm on the uh, more or less completely quantitative uh, side and more technology than ever. Um, so it's kind of, um, not kind of a straightforward um, career path, if you like, uh, but this Python for Finance thing uh, started out then almost, yeah, 10 years ago, r roughly 10 years ago, where we started implementing our first uh, solutions using Python. Back then in the days where we even didn't have a NumPy, it was called numeric back then and so forth, you know, we, we started out quite early where people said Python is not really well suited uh, to do finance at all, actually. <laughs> That's when we started out doing it. Right, okay. Well, bring us up to speed, Eve, and, and tell us about what you're doing today. Like, what's your, what's your current involvement in the industry? I guess uh, uh, one of the most uh, popular and, and famous things, I guess, what, what we produce, what I produce is my Python for Finance book for O'Reilly. And I think these are the two things that uh, make up what we do on a daily basis. So on one hand side, it's Python. And on the other hand, it's finance. So actually, we work usually on a contractual basis for financial clients. This ranges from banks to asset managers to hedge funds to exchanges. Exchanges have been quite a, quite a bit of a focus uh, recently and over the years. Um, but almost any kind of financial uh, um, company that we work on, uh, projects for them, obviously with Python being involved. So what we don't do is kind of um, do other projects just for the sake of the project and then doing uh, focus on C++, for example, in this regard. So what we do, what we are good at, 
And there, I guess, we cover the whole value chain, if you like, from trainings to books to platform to our library to the services, which means the consulting and development. This is Python and Python for quantitative finance. And if you want to get a little bit more specific, uh, what we focus on is what I usually call computational finance and financial data science. These might be the best uh, two sub-disciplines to describe what we do in quantitative finance. Cool. Okay. Well, could you give us perhaps um, just an example of some of the projects you might work on on the consultancy side of things? Yeah, obviously, uh, more often than not, uh, we, we sign some NDA contracts, obviously, uh, non-disclosure agreements where we are not allowed to speak about the things we do. But there's uh, at least one good thing that we can talk about. This is something we did for Eurex, uh, our German derivatives exchange, which is a part of Deutsche Börse, actually. Um, so um, there we did a Python-based tutorial series. Uh, well, we did a couple of things for them. So we wrote a tutorial about the VSTOX volatility index and how it is calculated, uh, uh, what you need to do when you want to implement this in Python, how to recalculate historical values and so forth. It's kind of a very involved thing using lots of option pricing theories and, and not rather complicated but still involved uh, financial algorithms. And we, and we wrote this tutorial like in a, in a book style and actually right now I transformed it to a book so it will come out soon. Uh, and therefore I can speak about all this because it's public and it will be published as a book. Um, and uh, not only this, what we also did, we wrote uh, a backtesting application for them uh, where you can backtest strategies uh, for the whole history of the VSTOX index involving VSTOX options, VSTOX futures, and so forth. And in, in a tutorial, we explain the strategies that it can use. We explain how to value futures, how to value options. Uh, and again, this is kind of a public thing. Everybody interested uh, in it uh, can Google it up. It's called um, VSTOX and, and uh, Variance Advanced Services. So if you Google UX Advanced Services, you will find... Uh, the right place to start and to go from there. Okay, well, we'll dig up a link and we'll be sure to include that in the show notes at chatwithtraders.com. So I know you've been working with asymmetric return capital a little bit recently. Can you tell us any more about what you're doing with them? Yeah, this is kind of an uh, emerging asset manager, a hedge fund, uh, which is focused on uh, volatility uh, trading strategies. So I was talking about the V-stocks and various things we've done. So there's kind of uh, a few synergies involved in what we do there. And even more synergies uh, with regard to that we apply for them. And it's one of our first uh, big users, at least uh, as I'm aware of, because our DX analytics library is open source. So we don't even know who is using it uh, for what purposes. But here we work with our client in a very um, a close fashion uh, to apply our DX analytics uh, suite. We should include the link as well. So it's uh, dx-analytics.com. Uh, it's open source, so you can download and test it. And we use it there for advanced derivatives analytics and risk management purposes. Uh, we have built kind of, uh, in addition to what the open source library provides, kind of a, a complete system around that to, to really make use on a daily efficient uh, basis that uh, when the decision makers like Prime Risk, who's the founder I'm working with uh, since more than two years right now, uh, needs to make a decision, then he has kind of real-time uh, capabilities to apply what we have uh, built with uh, DX Analytics. And this is kind of an interesting um, um, company to mention in the context we're discussing here because uh, more or less uh, you can say that ARC is is a Python-based hedge fund, if, if you like. So um, one of the, the, the co-founders there, actually, Adam, gave a talk at our conference last year in Manhattan where he spoke about how to build a hedge fund with Python. So <laughs> this is actually a, a very good um, example for what we discuss here. Interesting. Is that, is that talk available online anywhere? Uh, this is not available online, so uh, we do it for Python Quant Series. Maybe, maybe we cover this uh, later on uh, in cooperation with uh, Fitch. So for those who have signed up for the online um, uh, tickets, they have access to it, but it's not publicly available, unfortunately, depending on what perspective you have. Got it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So on an individual level, like for yourself, do you actually participate in markets in any way? Are you, you know, actively trading? I know you're not actively trading, of course, but um, are you investing in, in any way, shape or form? I mean, what I do is kind of more or less for retirement purposes that I have my continuous savings plans and so forth. Uh, 
uh, in this regard, investing in, in mutual funds and different uh, asset classes. But what I'm not doing is kind of uh, day trading work or whatsoever. I mean, I'm involved in so many things and, and traveling quite a bit. So sitting, sitting on an airplane for eight hours would make me nervous if something <laughs> would go wrong. And on the other hand, obviously, uh, being involved with so many financial institutions, which have uh, obviously heavy, uh, heavy trading uh, um, shops, um, businesses uh, makes it uh, also a little bit difficult depending on the work that we do, how we get involved in things and usually we are quite close for example with what I described earlier with ARC uh, and so uh, there might be also uh, conflicts of interest but this is not the main reason, the main reason is that uh, A, I'm running uh, a few businesses, not only the Python quants, a few other side businesses as well, I'm traveling quite a bit so I decided for myself don't get even more nervous and, and uh, have even more workload uh, being involved in the markets on a daily basis Sure, sure. That makes sense. Now, let's spend a little time actually talking about quantitative finance. So, first of all, what does the term quant refer to and how does a quant vary from other types of market participants? Yeah, I mean, the term quant is, uh, as far as I see it, used in many different ways these days. So, uh, maybe in a more narrow sense, it's, it describes the quantitative analyst to a certain extent, whereby I mean uh, not an analyst starting out in the business, but an analyst analyzing anything with quantitative means, which means typically lots of numbers are involved, lots of data is involved, and, and you get uh, down to the numerics and to the, to the many, many digits that might be important in this regard. So a quant in a bank uh, usually can also have different roles. So you might have uh, a pricing quant, which is uh, responsible for the pricing of derivatives instruments. You have a risk quant, which is smaller than the back office, for example, uh, responsible for things going on overnight when it comes to value at risk or XVA calculation. So you have many types of quants. Uh, but in the end, what uh, what every type has uh, in common is that they work with uh, with uh, many, many, yeah, let's say, <laughs> numbers, with data, with formulas, with math, and, and try to make sense of the markets in the end. Um, and from my point of view, what I, what I mentioned before, in a sense of that we do computational finance and financial data science, um, there might be a third major role where we are not involved that much, is kind of the typical, the model quant. Uh, I guess this is the starting point where it all started out with the rocket scientists on Wall Street in maybe the 80s where they hired physicists and mathematicians uh, to come up with better models for instruments already traded but where sometimes nobody knew for sure how this is to be valued. Um, but I guess when it comes to the, to the ratio, to the proportion of the model quants in relation to the whole quant universe, uh, this is less than 1%, I would say, people focusing today of uh, building and coming up with new models. Uh, the majority of people is more or less concerned with impl implementing what the models say and what you have to do in terms of compliance and trading and so forth. Uh, then we come to computational finance. How do you simulate a stochastic differential equation? Um, how do you price this with numerical methods? Uh, and the guys working on the financial data science more or less making sure that all data is available, that data is consistent, that it is processed in, in a, an appropriate way. So this is more or less my world of thinking. Other people might have a different world of thinking and they can cut it differently. Uh, but from my point of view, I usually think of the model quant, the computational finance guy, and the, um, and the uh, data people, the financial data science people that take care that uh, everybody gets the data uh, who needs it and in time and with the right quality. Okay, that's a great answer. And I like how you mentioned that there seem to be many different types of quants because, I mean, it's kind of become obvious to me that, you know, there's the guys who are very deep into the math and they're coming up with the formulas. And then you have those who are more focused on just analyzing big data to develop, you know, algorithmic trading strategies. So, no, that was, that was a brilliant answer, Eve. How would you say a quant looks for opportunity? Like, just to, generally speaking, how does a quant look for opportunity and areas where they can exploit the market? Yeah, I mean, there are quite a few areas uh, where quants are working on. So if you have a look at the history of kind of investment, um, I mean, it all started out more or less with kind of fundamental research combined with speculation. So we always had this kind of 
uh, yeah, groups of people were the one group was saying, well, we have to deeply analyze things that are going on, the fundamentals of the company, what are the prospects, how does the market look like, and so forth. And more or less others that said, well, I'm in the markets, but I'm simply trading. So uh, maybe the Great Recession in the 20s in the U.S. and so forth is like kind of a picture of what what this, uh, what this kind of uh, situation might lead to. Uh, these days we have many, many more things and, and this is where the quants come into play because neither fundamental analysis nor the speculators are that quanty, if you like. Um, it more or less started out with the uh, Markowitz theory, uh, the portfolio theory based on mean variance. But for the first time someone came up and said, well, let's have a, a quanty look at how things are going. Uh, to keep the word simple, and this was already a major breakthrough, uh, we focus on certain uh, statistics that characterize different stocks, actually, as the expected mean return, as the to be expected volatility, and let's take these two parameters. I mean, it's a little bit too simplifying, but still used these days heavily, uh, but let's take these parameters and let's build kind of uh, mathematically optimized portfolios based on our criteria. I, I guess this is more or less uh, the starting point of, of quant finance uh, when you have a look at the history. Uh, only later on uh, we have the other area where we say, well, uh, with the plex Colts theory and option pricing, where we t then start to talk about derivatives, which means uh, securities whose price, whose value is derived from something else, kind of stock, an index, or whatsoever. Um, I guess there maybe people started talking about quant, but more or less for me, portfolio theory, mean variance, uh, the cap M, for example, are all examples of quant work as well. Uh, coming to the option pricing theory of Black Scholes, um, um, which uh, later on awarded them the, the uh, Nobel Prize for Economics, Actually, uh, we're at a point where we say now we need to get back uh, to history because uh, something like Black Scholes theory was uh, already invented by uh, a, call, a guy called Bachelier, a French guy who wrote his PhD thesis about similar topics in 1900, but his PhD thesis in math actually began about speculation and how to price uh, options with arithmetic uh, brown emotion was only 50 years plus later on discovered. So nobody was aware of, of what, what he already invented for, for multiple decades actually. So maybe this was the first real quant, if you like, in our, uh, in our model quant definition as of today. Um, so we have the people who try to optimize portfolios with regard to certain mathematical methods, quanti methods. We have uh, the option, the model quant guys, Later on then, uh, the emergence of uh, uh, trading strategies where statistics is used, for example, statistical arbitrage. Uh, when it comes to derivatives, the theory at least goes uh, that when you use a strong arbitrage argument, uh, there is kind of a, a existing provable mathematical relationship between A and B. So you have option pricing theory and this gives you the relationship. There should be no doubt in theory, but in practice, obviously, there is a lot of doubt and a lot of uh, yeah, market, so to say, uh, playing into the game. Uh, but the statistical arbitrage, you are aware of that you might want to exploit kind of a historical relationship with regard to correlation or whatsoever, um, where I say, well, statistically, if you traded this and that way, like gold versus gold miners, for example, is a classical trade, um, then we should make money because now we have kind of something which is statistically beyond the normal, beyond one standard deviation or whatsoever. We might speculate of uh, bringing this back to the, to the historical means or the, to the historical values that we observed. Um, and this goes on until today where we have, uh, I mean, there are many disciplines and sub-disciplines in between that, uh, where we have today the high-frequency traders, which are not exploiting kind of financial relationships more or less, but they are trying to exploit the market microstructure, uh, playing the system more or less and not going about financial uh, economical principles, if you like. So what I, what I always say, the whole financial theory when we talk about quant stuff is more or less based on daily historical closing values of indices, stocks and so forth. Uh, but what these people are doing right now is still lacking kind of a financial uh, background, financial theory which, which can compare to the uh, daily uh, closing price based uh, theories that we have available. So many, many types uh, of, uh, of strategies that you can use to exploit the market actually. Right, so just narrowing in on the topic of research here, 
one thing I'd like to ask you about is do you utilize uh, machine learning in any way during your, your research uh, phase when you're looking for um, opportunities within markets? So I must, so to say, in this regard, confess that we are, uh, due to what we do, uh, derivatives, analytics, option pricing, and so forth, we are what I mentioned before on the site where we at least think that we are uh, in a position where we can more or less derive prices from what we observe in the market in a not deterministic fashion, but in a rather robust fashion, uh, and can prove this mathematically, so to say. Um, so in my daily work, uh, at least a few machine learning approaches are deployed, but this is nothing which represents kind of a focus as of these days. I know many people are kind of eager to use it, and I even get approached by people, I don't know, from around the globe, actually, um, who, are, who are interested in this topic about applying machine learning to find and what this implies and so forth. And I mean, these days, if you hear about AlphaGo uh, beating one of the greatest masters of the Go game and so forth, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, I mean, all these disciplines people are so fascinated about. And everybody is, is uh, thinking of, well, we must have something in there in this uh, r big toolbox which we can apply to financial markets. And I'm pretty sure there is something, but Frankie, I have, at least for my daily work, I haven't seen anything where I say, well, this is kind of a, a real area where we get major benefits of applying this or the other technique uh, to what we do. And if you speak about we, I'm not speaking for the whole uh, industry. I'm speaking for, for our uh, focus areas, actually. Okay. That's an interesting answer. It's interesting. So still on the same topic here. Is everything you do, is it based purely on price or do you use other things in combination such as uh, fundamental and social data? Do they come into the picture at all? I mean, generally speaking, obviously what you're mentioning here, price, fundamental, social data uh, are all sources that are used um, in the industry to base investment decisions on and so forth. Uh, but again, I would say what we do is at least 90% based on price or market data, which is readily observable, and where there is typically no doubt about it. Uh, so if you think about fundamentals and price earnings ratios, which are forecasted and which then influence, you know, there's kind of still lots of uncertainty uh, around that uh, social data as well, about the quality and so forth, all the the people that try to make sense of Twitter data and so forth. But again, I've seen so many talks about this over the last two, three, four years. Um, but still, uh, I'm not aware of anybody who is using this kind of as a major tool and makes consistently above average returns. So it generates a significant alpha, if you like, as we call it uh, in the industry, uh, out of that. There might be some people who <laughs> don't speak about it. Um, and there are also companies, uh, startups, that focus completely on that. Uh, but uh, but I'm not aware, at least from what I've seen in, in terms of talks and read papers about that, uh, where it is. But as a supporting thing, um, I mean, this might be really valuable in terms of like risk management. I've seen a talk recently where they said, well, uh, we don't want to exploit the markets based on social data. But for example, we want to generate kind of uh, uh, risk relevant information. And this was a bank speaking about that in the sense that they said, well, we are lending to so many companies, but we want to exploit the social media to get kind of early indicators with regard to uh, the risk for default for loans in our portfolio. And this makes sense. I, there, there I can see kind of a strong connection when, when many people are tweeting and traders are tweeting and speaking about, oh, well, this company and there's something, I don't know, you really don't know, there's a risk uh, on the horizon. But this might be valuable information for a bank to say, well, we must speak to these people because there might be something at risk. Uh, but this is on a, on a longer term scale. And it's not like in financial markets that there's kind of an idea and it's exploited by 20 players, bigger players in the market, and then the opportunity has vanished. Uh, risk of a loan, I mean, this is more like a thing over months, quarters, or even years where this information might be relevant. But I want to add one thing, and there I see kind of a huge opportunity, um, and I'm working closely with uh, Tom's Reuters. Actually, and what they are now bringing out, it's now in the beta testing phase, is kind of, uh, first of all, they, they implemented a unified API to the whole data universe, which means historical data, tick data, as well as streaming data. So, and the data universe is huge. Uh, and around this unified API, actually, you, you have a Python wrapper available these days. 
And uh, that's the reason why I'm coming to this point. And with this Python Web to the Unified API, you not only get prices for an index or whatsoever, you get more or less all the fundamentals that you need for a company. And you get access to news data, to social data as well. So having this kind of unified tool um, to process such data on, on a large scale, I mean, just think of a trader sitting in front of his Bloomberg and Thomas Reuters terminal um, and trying to figure out this manually. Uh, this is surely impossible. This doesn't work. But having this unified API and, and Python as a language, it's not the only language, uh, but the, one of the languages they support is Python, obviously. But having Python available, for example, and being able to now easily combine all the information this might bring up something where people say, well, now we got it. Now we, we cracked the code and now we got the practice through with regard to combining all the different uh, sources and different types of data that is available. Okay, so is that API available to everyone or is it a, a premium service? Like how do you get access to that? Actually not available, uh, obviously, to everyone. But if you are a subscriber to the Thomson Reuters Icon uh, Terminal, uh, then this is uh, actually included. But you need to have the, the data service, the terminal uh, license itself, and then you uh, get access to the, to the API and uh, uh, to the Python wrapper anyways. So, but the API, I guess, is the, is the new, the big thing. Got it. Okay. That's very cool. That's awesome. Yeah, for research, it's kind of, uh, this will be a quantum leap, actually, from my point of view. Yeah, no doubt. So, Tell us a little bit about the Python quants. You mentioned it a little bit earlier, but let's let's spend a little time on it and um, yeah, share with us where did the idea come from and, and how this gets started. Actually, I mentioned that I founded my first company in 2001 and for personal reasons I left this company, so we are still friendly, the founders back then, <laughs> myself. Um, and when I started my own company, I mean, this was the point more or less when we started using Python, so roughly 10 years ago. I started out with a company which is now called Python Quants. Back then it wasn't called Python Quants, but we, we named it uh, uh, two years ago, two or three years ago to the Python Quants. We used this name for quite a while, but no, well, then, back then we made it official um, because this was actually or describes the work that we do. We, we use Python to do quant work, uh, what we're discussing uh, in this podcast, actually. Um, so uh, this is where it all started out, and I guess uh, what we do right now, and I mentioned it before briefly, is that we try to cover the whole value chain in this niche market, if you like, that people, no matter what uh, kind of company they are working for, want to apply Python for their quant work. Uh, we try to provide everything that they need, which starts obviously with the books, uh, three books, my Python for Finance book uh, with O'Reilly, there is the derivatives analytics with Python book with Wiley Finance, and the next one coming out, listed volatility and variance derivatives also with Wiley. Um, everything obviously Python based, uh, you find all the codes, and we are not providing the codes. In the book, we provide uh, GitHub repositories providing the books. We provide a plat our, on our quant platform uh, where you can easily register. We provide executable Jupyter notebooks and all the code. So uh, this already, the book example already illustrates what we all offer. So, so the books, the codes, the quant platform, also training around that if you like. Uh, we organize uh, events around that. So we have uh, our next big event is... Um, is in May. It's the first week of May from the 2nd to the 6th. We have five days for, for Python Quants Conference in, in uh, New York, Manhattan, where we have four days of intensive training, starting with the introductory part, then we have a technical uh, a part which focuses on advanced libraries and performance Python, input-output, and so forth. We then have a full day of Python and Excel, so how to uh, best combine Python with Excel, which is still kind of a, obviously a very popular tool in the financial industry. We then have also an algorithmic financial trading uh, day where we cover the basics from backtesting in and out sample and so forth, implementing algorithmic trading strategies and doing even live trading on the Oanda platform. So people coming in in the morning, they will do their uh, automated algo trading in the evening. So I guess it's a very intense one day, but uh, people can get back home and start their own trading strategies afterwards. And then obviously we have the conference day, uh, the, the, the 6th of May this year, uh, where we have usually 10 talks with high-level 
uh, speakers uh, out of the industry uh, using Python for quant finance and associated things like sometimes also people speaking about R and Julia, uh, which I consider also as very nice um, uh, open source technology in the space, stuff we also use, especially R, as a complement uh, for Python. In addition to that, just to make uh, it complete, uh, we also organize meetups. My biggest meetup group is the Python for Quant Finance meetup group in, in London. Where we have roughly 1,300 people. Um, as of today, we started out a little bit more than two years ago. And you see London alone is kind of, uh, although we are really niche, Python for Quant Finance is a double niche, if you like. Um, we are very active, usually having meetups with up to 100 people, eight meetups a year, many other uh, things that we do, and so forth. So... Uh, many, many things around everything with regard to technology, services that we provide, training, development, consulting, um, uh, the books that we have, and also the community aspects, the conferences, uh, the public trainings, and also the meetup groups that we run. I'm also running something in, in New York as well. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, in the financial centers of the world um, doing Python for quant finance. And this year, we will also... Uh, conquer Asia as well, starting in June when I will be in Singapore. Um, so, yeah, we try our best to spread the word and to help people. Yeah, that's awesome. And, it, you know, that five-day event sounds really great. I wish I could make it along. Too bad I'm on the other side of the world. But um, We're getting back to London as well. Usually we have the London one in November. So later in the year we are in, uh, in London and in May usually we are in, in Manhattan. Right, okay. Cool. So, who are the type of people who generally attend these types of, um, you know, your meetups and your events and that sort of thing? Are they people who are like professionals within the industry or do you get like quite a few independent traders and, um, yeah, like who attends these types of events? I mean, it's a great mix. Uh, speaking of 1,300 people in one group, we of, you obviously have a mix of starting with students interested in a topic or, or PhD students, uh, postdocs. Uh, two industry players, um, startup people and from the fintech space, um, people working for the biggest banks at all, like Bank of America, JP Morgan, people from hedge funds, uh, uh, yeah, traders who trade on their own. So I think we cover quite, uh, yeah, quite the, the whole cross-section of, of people that you find that are either already using Python for quant finance or want to use it. So we have many, many people and I'm always asking, was well, the first time here and uh, do you use Python? So the typical questions during the meeting and we, we have at least 20 to 30% per meter where people are coming uh, uh, for the first time and don't have used uh, Python really. Many, some people say, well, I have done a little bit, but now I want to apply it really for my finance work. So uh, people who really want to get into that and, and yeah, want to make better use of, of this uh, fantastic ecosystem that we have for Python. Okay. Well, let's spend a little time on Python as a language. So it's clear that Python is your weapon of choice. Why did you choose Python over other programming languages? I mean, it's a little bit, usually I start out by saying, well, there's so many languages in the world, um, but there is English. Uh, I mean, speaking English as of today might be the best choice as a foreign language. If you're a native speaker, there's not that much of reasoning uh, behind doing it because you simply do it. But um, if I could only learn one language uh, this, these days, it would probably be English. If I could only learn one programming language, it would probably be Python. Um, I mean, Python doesn't have anything where you say, well, this particular feature or this kind of syntax idiom or whatsoever you, you, you single out um, is not found in any other place. So Python is, from my point of view, nothing that special. It, it makes more or less the combination of so many things. On the one hand side, obviously, it is the syntax, which is typically quite appealing to two quants, actually. So if you are mathematically inclined, if you like equations, if you, if you know how to code LaTeX in order to produce nice looking documents with lots of formulae, uh, then you will like Python for sure because it's so close. Um, uh, you will find yeah, that, that you are back home and not in a foreign country. Uh, many people say, well, Python fits in your mind. Uh, you have many languages where kind of the, the barriers of entry are so high and you get frustrated only to get the most simple things running. Uh, and this actually is not the case with Python. So you can easily start out. Uh, it's for, even for my son who is nine, who's sometimes coding a little bit uh, with my guidance. 
um, also to the absolute expert programmer. So Python is kind of scalable and then, um, but if I would have to single out one thing, why Python over other languages, and then in parentheses for finance, I would say, well, um, it is probably the ecosystem that we have. All the libraries, everything that you can use in terms of third-party libraries, if you like, the, the, all the major open source projects like Pandas, PyTables, Scikit-Learn, Scikit-Image, you name it, uh, all these uh, fantastic libraries that you get for free and which are kind of very, very powerful, and especially to single out in this ecosystem one, I guess pandas for data crunching, number crunching, financial time series analysis, visualization, and so forth is something um, that brings many people to Python. Uh, the other thing is that actually IPython Notebook uh, in former days brought many people to Python, our nice web-based interactive uh, uh, development environment. Uh, but this has become language agnostic with the Jupyter project, so um, they now have different kernels running, and there is no need to come to Python for Jupyter. You can do Jupyter with Julia R as well. So, uh, but back in the days, it was kind of these single libraries which are powerful, and actually some nice tools that we we had to offer and still have to offer, obviously. So they haven't gone, but they have become more or less uh, uh, language agnostic. Right. Well, I can tell you that I wish I certainly started programming when I was nine years old. I'd be <laughs> much further ahead than where I am right now, but I guess uh, now is better than never. So now you, you mentioned right at the start there that there are, you know, so many languages out there that you could have chosen uh, from, but, you know, you, you went with Python. Um, is it a popular choice used in the finance industry? Like obviously you use it in the finance industry. Is it, um, is it like widely accepted? Yeah, I think it's one of the most popular languages uh, at all these days. Many of the biggest banks in the world now uh, do major things in Python. Uh, to name two, there is uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, uh, where they have uh, implemented their core risk management and trading platform, which is called Quartz. It's actually a big project. Uh, mainly in Python. Obviously, typically doing these big projects, uh, you don't use a single language only. So you have uh, typically a blend of technologies and languages that you use. But Python is the major language driving this big project. And the last number I heard is that uh, it's uh, with 14 million lines of code. It's kind of the biggest uh, financial system based on Python in production as of today. Um, the other one is JP Morgan uh, with Athena. Um, they are their trading and also risk uh, platform uh, where Python also plays a major part. Um, so big banks are using Python, and you can name it. Uh, pick out any bank, Deutsche Bank, and so forth. Uh, to some extent, they are using Python. I, I, I mentioned those who have it as a strategic platform technology. Others, for example, Deutsche Bank uses it in many, many places, but not maybe as a core technology, if you like. Um, so if we now go more to the asset management, the hedge fund side, um, and I guess the, the hedge funds have been here front runners, uh, you will find many, many of the biggest uh, hedge funds in the world that make heavy use of Python. Uh, uh, to name just a few, it's, it's PDT Partners, it's AQR Capital Management, it's uh, Two Sigma in New York. So uh, some of the biggest hedge funds in the world use Python, again, as strategic uh, technology for what they do for research, production, and so forth. Um, on the asset management side, this is my experience also with regard to the business and trainings that we do, is that asset management, uh, the classical asset managers are now catching up and also have discovered that Python is kind of a good choice. But it's kind of a little bit beyond the wave. And what I see next is kind of uh, uh, getting more and more questions from the insurance industry. Uh, we haven't spoken about that and it's not our focus as of today, but I see more and more coming there as well. Um, and, and in the end, I guess Python will, will be kind of a strategic technology for almost any uh, company. And uh, getting back to our uh, introductory example of, of Arc, um, of the uh, emerging manager in New York, uh, actually, uh, and I can, uh, there are many, many other examples that it's similar. Uh, once you start out on your own these days, uh, and you can start from scratch and don't have legacy codes, I don't know, 10 million lines of C++ code in your pricing library, then it makes sense to use Python. Uh, 10 years ago, when we started out and did our first steps, it wouldn't have made sense uh, to use Python for kind of everything, uh, and especially not for your heavy analytics tasks. But as of today, if you are known of company, 
um, and it's your money and it's your time and, and you have to make sure that everything runs and you do in the best way you can, then typically you choose Python because uh, especially when it comes to analytics, I guess you have a factor uh, probably of 10 or sometimes 20 in terms of uh, reduction of number of lines of code that need to be written to accomplish the same when you compare C++ and then moving to Python. Uh, so you're much more efficient. You get many more, th or much more done in a much shorter period of time by using Python than other languages. But I, I don't speak against other languages, don't get me wrong. I mean, C++ and then all the, the compiled and high-performance languages, they have all their place. Uh, and Python can easily interact with these languages and, and, and libraries uh, implemented based on them. Uh, but when it comes to interactively explore stuff, prototype, and bringing this as fast as possible and as efficient as possible to production, I guess Python is kind of the right choice. Yeah, no, that's huge and an awesome answer, very insightful. In the past, you've given many talks, you know, over the years, you've, you've given a lot of presentations. One of the common themes throughout these presentations seems to be open source. What's the reason for your big push on open source and being such a um, you know, big advocate for, for technology and code and software being open sourced? Yeah, I mean, if you think back in history, um, then you had a time where open source was something which was exotic. Uh, we said, well, uh, well we are, I started out back in, in the 80s with the C64 and you had to, to buy your games and this was really expensive. You know, it's kind of, there wasn't open source available. You could, you could type stuff that you found in, in magazines or what. <laughs> this was open source, but you had to type it by yourself. But I think now, if, as of far we have come and what this means for our society, I would even like to say, when it comes to GitHub, for example. How many amazing projects do you find uh, on GitHub these days where you can uh, make uh, use free of any charge, where you can have a look at what's going on and uh, where there is the opportunity for other people to contribute and to improve that thing. And I want to get back to the example that I mentioned before. Pandas, from my point of view, is kind of a paramount example in this regard. Uh, when Wes McKinney started working on Pandas, he was employed as an analyst at AQR Capital Management, obviously one of the biggest uh, hedge funds in the world. There, uh, there uh, his intention was to promote Python, uh, but coming from R, he was aware of that the data frame object actually, which is so nice uh, to use in R, is missing. He said, well, we need this in Python as well, and so he started implementing Pandas and started rebuilding, if you like, compared to R, things that have been in R for quite a while, and now we introduced it to Python. But this was kind of a proprietary project for AQR. And it was not kind of a core project. I mean, by writing a data frame for Python, you don't make money per se for a hedge fund. <laughs> you make money by how you use it, what, what data you crunch, and what kind of algorithms and insights you come up uh, based on the data you're crunching. So uh, they made the, uh, uh, thank God, they, they, they made the decision indeed to open source it. Um, and now we have, this is one of the biggest libraries at all. I don't know whether the, the uh, current PDF documentation stands at uh, 2,000 pages already. The last count I have in mind is probably 1,800 pages for this single library alone. And it's so powerful and it's, uh, it has grown um, so fast and it's become so huge and uh, immensely uh, beneficial for our ecosystem. Uh, it would never have been the case if AKR would have said, well, this is something proprietary that only we should use. Uh, we don't open source it. Nobody should learn about what we have in Python and so forth. No, they did, from my point of view, the, the, the correct uh, decision. and said, well, this is not our core. If we open source that and provide others with the benefits of what we have implemented, then we might benefit back by others contributing to it. Uh, so we can use maybe features we haven't even thought about before uh, that others implement, and we have kind of the benefits as well. And this is kind of the perfect win-win situation that you see in so many uh, areas, and, and Pandas in our ecosystem is kind of one of the major examples. So now millions of people use it on a daily, weekly basis um, and have the benefits, and AQR also has the benefit because the library is now a hugely developed, highly efficient thing with a gazillion of features, uh, they never would have thought it that way. I mean, there are many things that they don't need, but uh, overall it's kind of beneficial uh, for our whole ecosystem, for the whole uh, Python community. So 
this is this is what I think of open source, where the major benefits are, and there are many, many more in terms of what uh, these days. Typically, when you apply for a developer position, you typically don't write any typical CV anymore. You just send the link to your GitHub repository and say, "Look what I've done so far in Python and JavaScript and C plus plus whatsoever. Here's what I can do, what I've worked on, and people can have a, a real look at what." Yeah, and not uh, yeah, uh, real look at real things, and not at a CV who tries to uh, sell something that is not there in, a, in the best possible manner. But many others, uh, many other arguments apply to this particular topic, from my point of view. And it really highlights the the value of collaboration too. So while we're on this subject, I'm, I'm keen to get your take and your views on what do you make of the what are the what are your thoughts on the pros and cons of open source languages versus uh, traders who use proprietary languages that are native to individual platforms? Like, what are the pros and cons between those two kind of approaches to to programming, if you want to call it that? I mean, obviously, when you when you learn kind of a general purpose language like Python, you can apply it in many different places. Uh, to learn a proprietary language, which you can only apply in one place. Might be a good investment uh, during a certain point in time uh, for a specific uh, reason, project, or what you ever are doing at this point. But I guess in general, it should be the other way around. Uh, we have uh, a couple of examples in this regard. For example, if you think of this big uh, front arena um, um, training front office uh, system, they use Python, for example, which is a general purpose language. To describe payoffs on their platform, there is a, this is the op the opposite, so to say. They say, well, we have a proprietary platform, but we use something as common as Python. W w many people, you can speak of even millions, can already program to do something which is specific to our platform. And I think this is the right way. Uh, why would you invent kind of a, a a another spoken written language to write a poem or whatsoever? Uh, I mean, English is there, or maybe you have another uh, mother tongue or whatsoever, but there's typically no need. But I guess in the end, it's, it's all about specialization and payoff and investment. If you say, well, what we are looking for and what we need is available out there, and there is such a huge business case, and this is uh, uh, sustainable for quite a while, uh, let's do th something on our own, um, this might be the way to go. So, for example, uh, Goldman Sachs has his own language with slang intern and, uh, internally and so forth. So there might be good reasons for bigger institutions for certain environments. But in general, I would say if, if there is something around which might be at least as good as what I have in mind to solve the problem, why not using it? I mean, just to have a proprietary, it's, it's what I usually also use as an argument against proprietary uh, data science platforms and so forth. You know, we have Jupyter Notebook. This is used by millions of people. There are, I don't know how many tens of millions of Jupyter Notebooks are available. But there are still people these days, they reinvent the notebook and come up with a new notebook with, a, with another format used by 500 people um, and with 1,500 notebooks available and which will never, ever get the traction of what is already there. So if there are good reasons to do that, because your company has specific requirements, you want to use it internally, fine. But as a startup, I would doubt this model, actually. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good point. So what are some of the, some of the best resources that you would recommend uh, for someone who's keen to, to start learning you know, the language of Python? Uh, you know, someone who's just maybe an independent trader, they might not be a PhD or have any programming experience. What are some good resources that they could... Um, start out with? I mean, uh, in this regard, I must come back to what we do. Uh, obviously, when it comes uh, to learning Python for finance, there's my book, there are the trainings we give. There. If you go to my private website, hillpitch.com, you find, I don't know, 50 plus talks about different topics uh, in notebook style, so you can easily copy that and use it on your own. Um, there are others who provide trainings or like Code Academy and so forth. There, there are many, many places where you can start out. But so, so in the end, it, I'm, it's, it's not only for me, I, I guess for everybody, it's impossible to name all the, the good resources that are out there. And I, I really think that there are many, many good resources out there. What my recommendation typically is uh, to people asking me this question, because I'm getting asked this uh, quite often, is um, learn the basics by reading a nice book or an online resource like the uh, 
scientific uh, lecture notes, uh, which are out there on on GitHub uh, for free. I don't know, 200 pages of well-written uh, lecture notes about Python uh, for scientific applications. So it's completely for free, and you can study that. Uh, do something like that as a starting point, and then pick a project and learn and pick up along the way what you need. Going to Stack Overflow, Google your stuff, uh, looking left and right. Uh, so, for example, uh, I mean, I knew about Python, for example, but it might be a nice project. I really like using the Raspberry Pi, for example, where you can easily learn Python. You can implement many, many uh, nice projects based on a Raspberry Pi, which is also fun, if you like that stuff, uh, to learn Python. But not only Python for the sake of Python, but to implement nice things that you can do with Python based on Raspberry Pi, even in including other hardware elements and so forth. Um, so this is usually my recommendation. Pick a project that you're interested in, and then try to build this project and pick up along the way all the ingredients, Python ingredients, other technologies uh, that you need in order to accomplish the goal of your project. I guess, from my point of view, this is the best learning experience. This is the, the very reason why I like to write books, why I like to implement bigger things on my own, uh, because this is the best way to learn. I'm, uh, get, getting a producer and, and not that much a consumer is the best way to learn. Just produce, whatever it is. Really good. So... I mean, just a, just another question to bounce off that one. Realistically, what sort of commitment is going to be required from a non-programmer to become efficient with this language? That's also it's a, it's a tricky question in a sense. I said the Python fits in your in your brain. Actually, it's nothing usually that that blows up your your brain. But in the end. I would say if you're really interested in learning it, uh, you will learn it quite fast. Just think of more like a child who is interested in playing a certain game or uh, when I remember the days when I got my first computer, time didn't play a role because it was so much fun to do it. Um, I was like, you know, no matter how long it takes, I will master it in the end. This was my thing. And back then we did assembler and stuff like that. You know, this was much more involved than the stuff we see here. So it took uh, weeks or even months until you got the first results. Here with Python, you start out and you see the first graphics that you generated on your own like five minutes later. You know, this is a, a real short feedback cycle. Um, but I guess... Uh, picking, learning the basics, uh, picking up a project, implementing it in a realistic fashion and doing it part-time or whatsoever, maybe half a year and I guess you'll never uh, have reached kind of a decent level uh, of Python. Okay, sure. And just to pick up on what you mentioned um, a couple of answers ago, the course on Code Academy is awesome. I've done that one. Um, that, was, that was really helpful. I think that was actually the first one I, first one I did. So that was my introduction to Python. And um, yeah, I learned a lot from that. So, all right, Evil, let's wrap this up. Um, you know, we've been talking for almost 60 minutes now. Where can listeners go to find out more about you? So maybe your best website and, you know, I know you're fairly active on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? It's uh, D-Y-J-H. So. Okay. And best website where listeners can find out more about you? Um, this is our company website, which is uh, tpq.io, like the Python quants, tpq.io. Uh, from there, you get kind of directed to the different areas, to the book stuff and so forth. And my private website is uh, hillpish.com. There you find all my talks and, and stuff like I mean, I have even there kind of links to my Raspberry Pi project, <laughs> what I mentioned before. It's kind of resources which are not kind of directly... Um, associated with uh, our company work, but um, yeah, stuff which is obviously to 90% about Python and quant finance. Yeah, that's great. Now I'll be sure to include all those links at chatwithtraders.com so listeners can find them all there in one place. Um, and just to recap, I know you've written three books. Can you just give us the title of those books in case listeners uh, want to check those out? Yeah, the first one, uh, which is actually out since uh, almost one and a half years right now, is the Python for Finance one, uh, which uh, has been published by O'Reilly. Um, this was December 2014. Then in July 2015, last year, my derivatives analytics with Python book came out. This is a little bit more involved. This is really about the finance side. It was an outgrowth of my university lecture. Um, so this is more, again, about 
quant finance uh, and how to do it in Python. So the Python for finance book teaches how to do it. The other one doesn't teach how to do Python. So, but the two together are kind of good companions if you are interested in derivatives analytics. And the third one is even a little bit more specific in a sense that I focus there on a certain uh, product category, which is uh, listed volatility and variance derivatives. Uh, uh, quite popular instruments these days with uh, increasing volumes over the years um, and explaining everything based on uh, Python code and more or less on interactive Python sessions. So very interactive, very easy to follow and uh, with all the books come all the resources. Every single figure, every single plot, every single table that you find in my books is reproducible with, uh, with the code that I provide. So reproducible research and publishing is uh, what I'm looking for here. Good stuff. All right, Eve, well, let's, uh, let's call this a wrap. Thank you very much for coming on. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and, and speak with me uh, this morning. So enjoy the rest of your day and let's stay in touch. Thank you for having me. I also really enjoyed it. Hey, I hope you found this episode interesting. And like I said at the beginning, if there was anything which you didn't quite understand or you'd like more context around, just leave a comment at chatwithtraders.com forward slash 84 and I'll do my best to point you in the right direction or I might even ask Eve if he can help out as well. Now, the second thing I'd like to repeat, which I also mentioned right at the start of this episode is I'm running a survey for Chat With Traders, okay? This is a very short survey. I think it's about 15 questions, all multiple choice answers. Take you about two minutes to complete max. The reason I'm running the survey is because, as you know, the podcast is free and it's financially supported by sponsors. Now, I want to make sure those sponsors are a good fit for you listening to this podcast and the sponsors want to know that they're connecting with a relevant audience as well. So if you can help support this podcast, please go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash survey to complete a very short survey. And because I appreciate you doing this, I'm going to give you a free gift. I'm not going to mention what that free gift is right now, but if you go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash survey, S-U-R-V-E-Y, it's all there. So please show your support. And if we don't speak in the meantime, I'll catch you next week. You've come to the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but don't worry, more great episodes are on the way. To stay updated with each great new episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, and we'd love it if you leave us a rating and review. We'll see you next time on Chat with Traders.